Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Alexander the Great. Now, he was one of the first historical figures I learned about, um, or I watched YouTube videos about. It was Epic History TV videos. They were phenomenal videos. That channel is amazing. But because it was the first one, big kind of history playlist I watched, I didn't really absorb much. So I'm ready to go back to him, learn about him. I definitely know more about uh, Napoleon, Caesar, Hannibal than I do about Alexander. So I'd like to bring that knowledge a bit up to that level. Not to say I'm an expert in those other people, but uh, I certainly know more about them than, than Alexander the Great. Let's do it. My name is Connor. I'm ready to learn right now. If you are not, there's the door. You're in the wrong class, my friend. Home mech is down the hall. Let's go. Of all the enlightened intellectuals, brilliant artisans, cutthroat generals, and great kings in world history, Alexander the Great is undeniably the most renowned and debated. Was this most legendary Macedonian king an enlightened ruler or a debauching tyrant? Did he eventually succumb to alcohol or belief in his own godhood? We here at Kings and Generals, after a long delay, hope to provide some insight into all of those myriad questions and many, many more. Welcome to our series on the stunning conquests of King of Macedon, Alexander III. Our first video will cover just how Alexander recovered from the apocal death of his father, Philip II, and consolidated power. Many scholars note that Alexander's education and Aristotle was crucial for his future endeavors. Thanks to our modern technology, you can learn from thousands of great experts through the sponsor of our video, Skillshare. Skillshare guys, make sure to use the slash Kings and Generals help offers them out. thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, One and of the more. biggest things I remember if you want to and further your career, to start the, a new hobby, or to improve yourself, Skillshare has a course the, for like, you. Cutting of the Most nuts. classes are under 60 minutes, making it easy to fit them into any schedule. There was like this All contest that is curated for learning, untie a knot, and he just like no took a sword to it. No premium classes. Everything is geared so towards helping you to and learn and improve didn't. yourself. The Kings and Generals team has been using Skillshare for years now, as it has courses on all aspects of our work, be it script writing, animation, illustration, producing, management, color correction, audio editing. This is not even half of what we learned from Skillshare. If you want to make videos like ours, Jake Bartlett's course called Animating with Ease in Adobe After Effects is the perfect place to start. While Brooke Glazer's Productivity for maps. Artists, Organizing Yourself for Success, is awesome if you want to be more productive. So what are you waiting for? Away by all Join the, us the maps and millions and of others in of learning and improving. In general, the special summer offer of is here. Amazing the first 1,000 of our subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare to start exploring their creativity today. In October 336 BC, on the eve of launching his invasion of the Achaemenid Empire, Philip II of Macedon died to an assassin's dagger leaving his ascendant kingdom to an uncertain future. But as soon as the monarch's body had been removed and order was restored, Antipater, one of Philip's most respected generals, immediately backed the late king's 20-year-old second son Alexander, who ascended to the throne as Alexander III. This young king inherited three key things from his father. Firstly, I just want to say this, this peninsula in Greece is one of the coolest natural uh, it's just one of the coolest natural, you know what I mean? Like, it looks like a trident, and it's a real, sorry. The new Macedonian army, with its stalwart phalanx, brilliant cavalry, and exceptional marshals. Secondly, the Hellenic League, a post chironia hegemony over every other Greek state except Sparta. Finally, Alexander inherited a Macedonian bridgehead in Western Asia Minor, manned by 10,000 troops under generals Parmenion and Attalus. But these inheritances were tenuous, and to keep them, Alexander would have to fight, politic and appease. Showing his mettle, the new king and his ruthless mother, Olympias, immediately conducted a dynastic purge of key opponents. 
a loyal friend was dispatched to Asia Minor, where, probably by compromising on military commands, he flipped Parmenion to Alexander's side and subsequently assassinated Attalus, who had been conspiring with external enemies. That decisive stroke purged perhaps the most Take threatening internal rival to Alexander's ah. kingship. Philip's death had also left the wider geopolitical situation incredibly unstable, triggering anti-Macedonian rumblings in the conquered Greek states, particularly Thebes and Athens, as well as unrest in subdued tribal areas such as Thrace and Illyria. Although advised by Antipater and others to remain cautious, Alexander, as he ever would, instead chose boldness and audacity. He grabbed 3,000 hand-picked cavalry and sped south along the coastal road in order to reassert royal authority. Arriving at the Vale of Tempe, Alexander found the pass between Mount Olympus and Mount Ossa held against him by a strong Thessalian force, who told the king to halt while they decided whether or not to admit him. Unwilling to sit by while this recalcitrant vassal blocked his path, Alexander had his Salute. men carve steps into the seaward side of Mount Ossa, rode his entire force over, and came up on the Thessalians from behind. So right away, he is not first impressions. Again, I did watch Epic History TV. That is like that was like eight months ago. The thing I remember most was the cutting of the knot. All right. So right away, not hesitant at all. Opposite of Justinian. Rode his entire force over and came up on the Thessalians from behind. He was quickly acknowledged as their overlord after that and moved on unhindered. With blistering speed, Alexander rode south and had the symbolically important Amphictyonic Council declare him hegemon at Thermopylae. Then, before the Greeks even knew what was happening, the Macedonian king materialized outside Thebes, shocking the proud city and assuring its temporary submission. Athens, which always chafed under Eve. Macedonian rule, nevertheless sent envoys north, assuring Alexander of its loyalty. His boldness, daring and ability having scared the Greeks into passivity, Alexander convened the Hellenic League at Corinth, had his status confirmed and then returned to Macedon. He did all of this in the course of two short months. The winter leading into 335 BC was spent giving the Macedonian army a crash course in mountain warfare. Now that Greece had been dealt with, Alexander needed to neutralize the rowdy tribes of Thrace and Illyria so that they were not a threat at home during the upcoming Persian invasion. When spring of 335 arrived, Alexander advanced north from Amphipolis at the head of 12,000 heavy infantry, Pezhetyroi, 8,000 lighter infantry, and 3,000 cavalry. Arian states that the Macedonian army first faced real Thracian opposition at Mount Hamus, where the lower slopes of the mountain rise through a narrow defile. This was probably the modern Shipka Pass. There, a substantial force of Thracians occupied the high pass, fronting their defensive position with a wagon fort. Okay, guys, so we already, sorry, uh, we already did that maneuver there, but just like Napoleon and Caesar and Hannibal, I'm trying to gauge Alexander as a leader and see. Hannibal, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, might be my favorite of the three in terms of their, we know much more about like the person Napoleon, I'd say, than we know about the person of even Caesar, or definitely Hannibal, I'd say, but I, I, I never really knew where to put Alexander, and so I'm learning about him right now, and uh, he seems very proactive. But Alexander, prescient both to his own weakness and the Thracians' offensive bent, realized that it was their plan to send the wagons crashing into his locked phalanx. He warned the heavy infantry of this and carefully instructed them how to deal with the situation. With that taken care of, Alexander ordered the ascent. Archers off to the right, phalanx regiments in the center, and his hypaspists on the left. As predicted, the Thracians sent their wagons careening down the mountain, straight at the tightly packed Macedonians. Following their king's instruction, the phalangites calmly broke formation and opened gaps to let the wagons go by harmlessly, if terrain allowed, 
and lay prone with their locked shields above their head if not. Not a single soldier was lost to the Thracian ploy, and the Macedonians rose to their feet with a cheer, morale at a high. With the primary threat dealt with, Alexander ordered the right flank archers to take up position in front of the phalanx, oh. where they repelled a number of weak Thracian attacks by loosing arrow volleys. When the heavy troops, whose advance was eased by the archers, reached the lip of the pass, they easily dislodged an enemy whose armor and weaponry was nowhere near theirs. 1,500 tribesmen were killed, but a significant number more managed to escape. Captured women, children, equipment, and goods were sent back to raise much needed funds. That was interesting. Descending onto the Danubian plain and the land of the Trebellians, Alexander encamped three days' march from the Danube at a tributary known as the Liginus. Sermus, king of the Trebellians, had been sending scouts to keep an eye on the Macedonian army's movement ever since their incursion began. Realizing he had to take action, the chief withdrew a large part of his population, warriors, women and children, to a large island in the middle of the Danube. Alerted to this suspicious population movement, Alexander pushed his army in that direction. However, he had only just set off when the king had his line of retreat and communication cut by a second Trebellian force, which slipped in behind. Decisively turning about, Alexander fought this contingent in the process of encamping near the Liginus. His pace appears to have caught them with their trousers down, and the barbarians retreated into a wooded glen. Loath to risk his heavy infantry, the king formed them up, but brought forward his missile troops to pepper the lighter-armed Trebellians with arrows and bolts, until, unable to endure the hail, they charged out. With his Thracian foe now shorn of their defensive terrain, inside which they were notoriously good fighters, Alexander sent a wing of Hetairoi at either flank. While Even the twice. So is he is part of the the archer thing to draw out the enemy into thinking like, wait, th those are just unprotected archers pelting us right now, and, and we're just taking it, and, and so it might make them think like, okay, archers, charge, charge, and then a little bit disorganized, Alexander then comes in and takes care of business. That happened twice in a row. Alex cut the tribesmen to ribbons. 3,000 of them died at the cost of 54 Macedonians. Three days march later, and Alexander reached the Danube directly opposite Sermus's island refuge, known as Puke. There, as planned, he rendezvoused with a small squadron of warships sent from Byzantium, manned them with heavy troops and archers, and launched an attack on the island. Unfortunately for the Macedonians, a mixture of dogged resistance, limited avenues of attack, and a fierce current led to the failure of this attack. Seeing he was getting nowhere, Alexander withdrew the ships to the southern bank. By that time, a formidable band of 10,000 nomadic Gete infantry and 4,000 horsemen had gathered on the far side of the Danube. Rather than seeing this as a threat, though, Alexander saw an opportunity. Smash the Gete, and the island might well surrender out of sheer terror. But his army had to cross the Danube, and his small fleet was not enough. So Alexander ordered that every single native canoe and craft be gathered up so that floats could be made from tents stuffed with hay. I don't know if it's because of the way Kings and Generals is presenting it or what, but he just seems so proactive, and I love that. He just seems like, okay, you go there. Oh, that isn't working. Back here. Oh, they showed up over there. Instead of getting scared, ooh, that's a good chance for us to slaughter them and then show them how, how vulnerable they are and they can surrender. Build boats. I love it. Thus provisioned with such a makeshift fleet, that night, masked by the darkness, Alexander boldly ferried 4,000 of his infantry and 1,500 cavalry across the Danube. Successful, he disembarked them on a section of the north bank, which was masked from the nearby Gete by tall fields of grain. Just before dawn, the king drew up his forces with infantry in front to flatten the grain with their sarissi and cavalry behind. The moment Alexander's strike force broke through the grain, 
the king personally charged his 1,500 cavalry straight at the Gete, while the terrifyingly disciplined Macedonian phalanx went forward in lockstep. Impacted by the fearsome companion cavalry and faced with the pincushion phalanx, the Gete collapsed and fled to a nearby town four miles from the river. But hotly pursued by the Macedonians, the semi-nomadic Gete mounted as many civilians as they could and fled onto the steppe. After leading his triumphant troops back to camp on the south shore, Alexander's prediction became reality. Simus and his Trebellions, awed into submission by this display of martial prowess, sent envoys of capitulation to the king. At about the same time, an embassy of tall Celts arrived, desiring Alexander's friendship. The king asked these veritable giants what they were scared of, hoping they would say his name. Instead, they famously remarked that they feared that the sky would fall on their heads. Alexander was not pleased, but sent them off as friends. With the potential danger posed by <laughs> Thrace adequately cut down, the Macedonian army marched south. Why are you afraid? The sky is going to fall on us. Oh. Well, get out of here. Okay. South via the Shipka Pass. Rather than turning south, Alexander He's pivoted so west and entered the domain of his ally, King Langaris of the Agrianians, who had accompanied the king on campaign with his force of deadly Agriani skirmishers. There he learned that the three Illyrian rulers, Cletus, Glaucius, and a prince of the Etoriantes, were in revolt against him. But for the moment, all of the king's enemies were scattered. So, leaving his faithful Agrianian colleague to deal with the Otariantes, Alexander sped to assail Cletus's mountain stronghold at Pelium before the Illyrians could join forces. The plain on which this citadel stood, dominating the Apsus Valley, was surrounded on three sides by densely wooded hills, which could only be traversed by a narrow pass. It was hard to get in, but also hard to get out. The moment Alexander marched his army onto the plain before Pelium, its defenders withdrew to safety behind the walls. Such freedom of the land allowed the Macedonian king to encamp and begin pulling forward his siege equipment. That proved to be a tactical error on Alexander's part. Less than 24 hours later, Glaucius and his Tolentian relief force arrived occupying strong positions on the wooded heights encircling Pelium and trapping Alexander. In need of supplies, the king dispatched the baggage train and a mounted escort under Philotus to forage near the hills. Noticing this, Glaucius shifted his forces and almost encircled Philotus, but Alexander reacted swiftly. Moving to Philotus's aid with a picked force of Agrianes, Hypaspists and 400 cavalry, the king managed to save his comrade and send Glaucius back onto the hills. I thought that was going to be another Despite this again. small win, the fact remained that the Macedonian army was in a bind, caused entirely by the king's hasty miscalculation. If Alexander attempted to withdraw through the narrow pass now, there was a danger that Cletus's Pelium garrison would assail his men from behind. If he stayed where he was, unable to gather supplies and ringed by enemies, the result would be inevitable destruction. To his credit, Alexander thought fast and came up with a ploy. He drew up the Sarissa Phalanx into a mass formation 120 ranks deep, flanked by 200 cavalry on either side. Then the king had his highly disciplined infantry conduct drills. At a signal, the Phalangites would have, in perfect unison, raised their Sarissi to vertical before lowering them to horizontal. Like a programmed machine of war, they pivoted right, left, back and forth again, all in utter silence. Disconcerted and enthralled by this unprecedented display of martial prowess, the barbarians were not ready when Alexander gave his final signal. Suddenly, the infantry clattered their spears against their shields and raised a war cry. At the same time, the left flank of the Macedonian Hetairoi seamlessly formed into a wedge and charged a portion of Glaucius's men guarding the hills. 
the demoralized Torlantians, taken aback by the charge and the noise, mostly abandoned their hilltop positions and withdrew into Pelium. Taking advantage of so I was starting to think maybe he's being too proactive, and yet I know Alexander the Great, he goes on to conquer vast areas of the world, and so there, there has, there, he, it can't just be, you know, people have got to catch on, okay, he's very much, maybe his worst quality is how active he is, and that he might get himself in a bad situation, and yet he has so many, he, he knows the power of intimidation, it's, of the opportunity his maneuvering had created, Alexander marched his army towards an escape route, a ford in the Apsus just east of Pelium. He secured a hill overlooking it without resistance, and ordered the Hypaspis to cross first, followed by the Phalanx. Realizing their quarry might be about to escape the trap, the tribesmen turned, descending on the crossing point. But Alexander, the Companions and Agrienes valiantly protected it for long enough that siege catapults could be set up on the far side, where they began bombarding the Illyrians. This first ever use of field artillery and covering fire from archers allowed the crossing to be completed. They made them on the other side of the river and they were able to be so good that they could launch over the Macedonians and actually hit the target. And all of a sudden, the Macedonians Engineers. were free. Not having lost a single man in extracting his army, and not content with just running away, Alexander withdrew a few miles from the Pelium area and waited, sending out constant scouting parties to see what Glaucius and Cletus were doing. After three days of general recuperation, a reconnaissance force returned with good news. Believing Alexander was gone, the Illyrians were strung out, encamped without sentries, fortifications or trenches. Sensing that an opportunity was ripe for the taking, Alexander assembled his usual crack force of companions, Agrianes and some archers, and went on the attack. Under the cover of a dark night, the Macedonian king moved back into the valley, and with his Agrianians at the forefront, assaulted the unsuspecting Illyrians on a narrow front. It was a slaughter. As Arian relates, some they killed in their beds, others they took without difficulty as they tried to escape. Many He's were so caught and aggressive. killed on the spot, many more as they fled in panic and disorder. Cletus, his entire army cut down or scattered by an enemy he thought long gone, fled to Pelium, set it ablaze, and then fled to refuge in Torlantian territory with Glaucius, whose forces suffered a similar fate. Our primary sources do not detail exactly where Alexander went next, but Peter Green believes that the Macedonians marched up the country to a crossing in the Tchena River, where they reunited with a victorious Langaris. With news of victory, however, the Agrianian king brought Alexander ill tidings from Greece. Always hating their new ignominious place under the iron boot of Macedon, Thebes and Athens, together with a number of other Greek states, had been bubbling towards revolt for some time. But when dangerous rumors spread that Alexander and his entire army had been killed by the Trebalians, Thebes in particular took the opportunity killed both senior officers of Alexander's garrison there and raised the standard of rebellion. I have a feeling you're going to Alexander, regret that. angered but understanding that this revolt probably had connections to rival elements in the court at Pella and might even be influenced by Persian gold, acted swiftly. Moving over 30,000 Man, he's aggressive. I don't it's not a bad quality, but I feel like um you know, like, like uh, Hannibal, for instance, was very aggressive, but he seemed much more wise. And I can't believe this works. This, I, I know Alexander the Great goes on to conquer a lot of stuff. Troops 250 miles at a speed of 18 miles a day through rough mountain terrain, the king descended into Thessaly, past Thermopylae, and encamped at Onchestus in Boeotia. Not long after that, in September 335 BC, he and his grizzled army were I taking up positions Thebes, outside I, Thebes, I much to the disbelief of the city's inhabitants. There was surely no way for an army of such a scale to arrive with such speed from a far-off barbarian country. 
Moreover, Alexander was dead anyway, as the rumors said. So this must have been an army of new Macedonian recruits under Antipater. Great map. Only slowly did the Thebans realize, to their consternation, that Alexander was indeed still alive and in charge. Uh oh. Fortunately for Thebes, the king's temper had cooled, and he was willing to be reasonable. Keen to reconcile with Greece so he could look to his Panhellenic war against the Achaemenid Empire, Alexander merely demanded that two of the uprising's ringleaders, Phoenix and Prothetes, be handed over, and everything else could be forgiven. The Thebans spat on this olive branch, making a brazen counter-demand that Philotas and Antipater should instead be handed to them. Moreover, all who wanted Greece free from the- I don't know if- I don't know if- I'm gonna go back five seconds. I don't know if that's a great learning experience for Alexander the Great, because this is the first time I'm seeing him take a more, you know, calm approach to a situation, and they just spat on it. Okay. Instead, be handed to them. Moreover, who? all who- Otis and Antipater should instead be handed to them. Okay. No. Moreover, all who wanted Greece free from this Macedonian tyrant should rally under the banner of the great king and Thebes. As Alexander flew into a rage at this nerve-grazing comment, Theban light infantry streamed from the gates and made lightning attacks on the Macedonian siege works with ranged weapons, killing a decent number of the king's troops and even approaching his main position before they were repulsed. Night okay. fell passed, and then the sun rose again, at which time Alexander shifted his army south to the Electra Gate, which was within shouting distance of his beleaguered garrison at the Cadmea Fortress. It is somewhat difficult to reconcile the disparate accounts of what came next. However, after three days, it seems as though a segment of Thebes's army, smaller than Alexander's, left the walls and deployed to face the king who arrayed a greater part of the relentless phalanx to meet them. Other smaller units were seconded to assault the city walls and attempted to breach the city, while another small contingent under Pedicus remained in reserve close to the palisade. As Roman historian Quintus Curtius Rufus relates of the main clash, the Macedonians exerted a force that could hardly be withstood because of the numbers of their men and the weight of the phalanx, but the Thebans were superior in bodily strength and in their constant training in the gymnasium. Fighting with grim determination to defend their families and city from slavery, the defenders came within a hair's breadth of breaking the phalanx. However, at the decisive moment, the mobile reserve units under Perdiccas outflanked the Theban line and managed to break into the city itself, swiftly followed by a detachment of Alexander's archers. Worse still, the, the Macedonian garrison in Cadmea, noticing the opportunity, broke out and caused even further disorder. Guys, what happened? How come all of the, the leaders I learn about after this, they don't really use archers in the same way? There, there had to have been some reason. When the king had his phalanx redouble their assault, the Thebans, realizing that the enemy was inside the walls, routed. Their cavalry managed to flee across into open country. The throng of stampeding, terrified hoplites was so great that the Electra gate became clogged and could not be closed before the main body of Alexander's infantry got inside. Bitter, brutal street fighting followed, during which a contingent of Thebes' soldiery fought a valiant last stand near the Amphaeum. But the Macedonians and their allies, sweeping atop the walls and around the streets, butchered them from every side. Thebes was brutally sacked. Arian tells us that the main culprits were Alexander's resentful anti-Thebes allies from Boeotia, such as the Phocians, Thespians and Plataeans. But the Macedonians certainly played a part. Doors were kicked in. Imagine, like, being Alexander the Great, and, and from what I've seen in the episode so far, being very just go, 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 attack, attack, and then taking the approach that he did with Thebes of being like, hey, send in, give me your, these two guys, and you'll all be forgiven. And then just to be sent back, no, you give me two of your guys. <laughs> and, and again, on those people who were... It's crazy. Imagine being like one of two people who an army sending outside the gates just sent in a letter to everyone saying, give us these two guys, meaning you and someone else, and you'll all be, be safe. 
And to actually go against that and say, no, it's pretty crazy. Houses and temples throughout the city stormed, and their occupants murdered or subjected to outrage without limit, be they man, woman, or child. By nightfall, the bloodbath had claimed 6,000 lives, and 30,000 more were captured. Alexander entrusted the broken city's final fate to the Allies, who had been long subjugated to it. As he probably intended, these Boeotians decided that Cadmia would remain garrisoned, but the remainder of the city was utterly annihilated, and its land divided among the Allies. Every woman and child would be sold into slavery. News of Thebes's grisly fate reverberated around Greece like an earthquake, prompting the execution of anti-Macedonian demagogues and the calming of revolts before they began. Compliance was the order of the day. Turning his burning gaze to Athens, which had remained aloof despite having played an obvious role in the outbreak, Alexander coldly ordered the great city to turn over 10 strategoi who had opposed his interest. Uh-oh. Okay, same strategy. I'm gonna guess it's, it's a no. Instead, an Athenian known as Demades went to Alexander and managed to persuade the king to forgive and forget, which he reluctantly did. But this final clemency didn't avail him in the long term. With Thebes's unprecedented and shocking extermination, Alexander hammered the final nail into the coffin of his relationship with other Greeks. Outwardly, they collaborated with cynical obsequiousness, as Peter Green tells us, but they never forgave him. After their first shocked terror had worn off, the attitude of the Greeks towards Alexander hardened into a bitter and implacable hatred. But for the moment, the king was not overly concerned with that. The invasion of the Achaemenid Empire was now imminent, and we'll talk about it in the next episode. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button this to channel see is it. So good. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible Unlike, without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the button. links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. Awesome. Phenomenal. Uh, this channel is always great. Um, yeah, really interesting. I'm into it for sure. I, uh, Alexander the Great has been one of those untouched, unflipped stones, if that makes sense. Like one of those big historical figures that I just... Let's be real, okay? I'm no expert on any historical figure at this point. I've been learning. But um, especially not so Alexander the Great. And so this has been very enjoyable. And I will watch the next five episodes. Absolutely. Yeah, he seems like a very proactive young guy who I, I'd imagine that strategy would, would work a lot in some cases, but not as long as, it, as, long as he continues. So I'd, I'd imagine he evolves as a commander. Uh, he has a very good grasp of uh, what to do in different situations. Phenomenal. Um, impressive. See you guys next time. Keep your chin up if you're not doing well. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. See ya.